having the ability to jump in and move through the classification process in a systematic way is an important curve. Now, the reason why it's important in the Pacific Northwest and other parts of the U.S. is that when you burn the landscape, you change both of those things in the Fabrician world. You mobilize a lot of material over a short amount of time, and you smooth the landscape surface, and you accomplish incredibly rapid sediment transport. And that's what we're experiencing all over the western U.S. right now. So Danica has done the same exercise in some post-burn areas. In this case, she's used uh, structure for motion on drones. And we put my hill slope class to get us uh, to work dropping particles. Um, that roughness parameter, you can measure in any number of ways. This is a table that just came out in the paper. Um, and there's everything from power spectra to eigenvalues to standard deviation of a surf of points relative to a plane. There's all kinds of ways to measure roughness, and it really depends on what you want. This paper by Smith and Warburton is motivated by the idea of trying to understand how peatlands erode, uh, and this is in northern England, and you can use these topographic characteristics to look at how these peatlands are going away, whether it's water, defecation, wind, all these different processes lead to the destabilization of peatlands, and they've been exploring how the rough distinguishers can reflect that. Um, contrast that with something out of the uh, fault mechanics literature. Emily Brodsky has looked at the details of fault zones, exhumed fault zones as well as ones in the laboratory, and used power spectral density to look at the roughness characteristics. Um, and there's amazing ability, because what she's been able to do is back out the strength of the fault based on the, the waviness and the asperities and how what they strength they need to prevent or give way to fault rupture. So roughness um, is this great amorphous thing that we all kind of think about, but maybe not confront in a systematic fashion as we could. So that was one of the things I wanted to emphasize here is that there's a process reason for thinking about understanding for quantifying roughness in all these different ways that I think um, people working in rivers, on hill slopes, on salt, whatever it is can take advantage of, but then there's the more fundamental thing that uh, Craig and others have told us about is just it's important for error. If you're going to do change detection, the roughness of that surface matters tremendously. So we have a lot of tools that have not been systematically addressed for uh, uh, thinking about roughness writ large. Uh, and finally, the top two items are things we've talked about more generally um, throughout this time together, our time together. So the, the, one of the last things I want to mention is something that's happening right now. You cannot find a place in the Western US right now that is smoke-free, it seems like, the more I look at the maps. This is the scene just over a year, uh, just under a year ago, in the Columbia River Gorge. That's in the background would be Multnomah Falls, if you've ever driven through the gorge. Um, on your way to Portland, it was on fire uh, last September for virtually a whole month. And so the question of how all these fire-prone landscapes are going to respond is a major endeavor that I think our community's tools can really help address. This is what it looked like soon after. The thing to note, and as Craig and Darren and others at NCOM are intimately familiar with, is a lot of vertical release. This is Columbia River flood basalts, a couple of kilometers stacked up of these um, basaltic rocks that give rise to cliffs and beautiful things like waterfalls that are interspersed with more gently sloping surfaces that are mantled with trees. So, just from the uh, bird's eye perspective from, from flights as well as field visits, the fire induced an incredible amount of sediment transfer. So the incineration of all that vegetation led to destabilization of talus, soil, rockfall, all kinds of things started moving. Uh, this is sort of the sort of typical view of some of these big tree and talus slopes along the interstate. The Department of Transportation, the Bureau of, uh, or sorry, the Army Corps of Engineers has been highly concerned. All the trails, the Pacific Crest Trail has been closed for a great deal of time because of this as well. So meters and meters of stuff piling up around the landscape due to the stabilization. So we got the idea that we could try to do um, some LIDAR work. And I wanted to give a huge caveat that I have been working uh, with LIDAR since 1995, we were just mentioning earlier. And I have done this and everyone else has done this. So I'm saying this as a, a bit of a dinosaur in the world is that this is the first change detection that I've worked on. And so I've been fortunate to have a student postdoc doing all the hard work. I'm just up here telling these stories. What Brooke has started to do, she just arrived um, a couple months ago in the lab. She's been pulling together data from 2005 onward from different sources, Army Corps, um, the Oregon LIDAR Consortium, and others. And we were able to pull together money from NSF and other agencies. And thanks to some heroic efforts 
by uh, Craig for making this happen and using that modular LIDAR that he mentioned earlier, putting it on a helicopter in the um, Portland area and flying this a few months ago that we have some post-fire um, data. I have no results. We got the data yesterday. Thank you again, Craig. I will um, buy you a beer later. Uh, but this is a, a glimpse of what it looks like. And so we will soon be um, interrogating this, um, uh, uh, Brooke will soon be interrogating this to try to better understand. And again, I think the one thing that people may not appreciate is the intimate connection with biology. Trees, ferns, all that stuff is front and center of what's causing this place to respond in such a dramatic fashion. Um, early efforts at looking at change detection from the 2009 and the 2010 data sets, just to sort of practice, see what's possible, suggest that we're um, getting relatively reasonable uh, error, um, even on steep slopes, 30 to 41 degrees, underneath uh, 40 to 50 meters of canopy, Douglas fir, which is pretty dense stuff, but we're still getting at least under a meter uh, and averaging you know, 20 to 30 centimeters in some of these areas. Once you get to some of these steps, the errors pop up. So there's classification, there's interpolation errors, and we're absolutely gonna have to move to the, the point cloud-based mode of thinking. Um, Craig mentioned this to me last night, and I had this slide already in the talk, but this is also what makes this landscape a fabulous geomorphic laboratory, but a bane to people trying to trim the clouds is these things like overhangs, where there's trees growing underneath here. Uh, and so this really <coughs> requires us to think about not just airborne lasers, but uh, terrestrial drones. And my colleague, Lee Karlstrom, is, is already going after some drone-based surveys of this area as well. And more generally though, the steep areas of the western U.S. are going to need change detection and they are steep. And so getting a better sense of the error and understanding where we can and can't detect change is absolutely essential to um, understanding what's happening in the western U.S. Me looking at these talus-based uh, erosional events has um, suggested to me that there's a, um, an opportunity to try to track sediment more uh, coherently across the landscape. So change detection algorithms that actually try to accommodate and integrate the, the path. So using flow algorithms to take material that's moving somewhere and, and transport it down slope and compare what we see with change relative to these flow paths um, is uh, an area of promise as well. And there's a nice paper that sort of started to get at this one that just came out earlier this year as well. We can start to, to think about continuity, sediment transport itself, not just something going up or down, uh, but um, the actual transport. And the final thing, um, I'll just make a plug for the paleo seismology colleagues that I hang out with, is that LIDAR has done more than just find faults in the forest, uh, which it has been tremendously successful of. This is an example of our efforts that just came out in EOS last two weeks ago of how LIDAR has really changed the game and our ability to think about Cascadia earthquakes and we're able to map landslides in the forest that have made little lakes and we've been going out and generating dendrochronology um, uh, analyses to determine if those tree rings match up with the last 1700 events that we know rock um, Cascadia. So LIDAR, this would not be possible without LIDAR. We are finding needles in the haystack and then doing very detailed localized work trying to connect them to actual geologic events in our past. I'll leave it at that. Josh, just, uh, can you, you were talking a little bit about the, um, some of the needs. Yeah. And so you said, you know, sort of higher performance classification or. Uh, More accessible classification, I guess, and is, is a big part of it. So you mean just like more than lab tools or more than like different methods or just uh, easier to use software or I, I, online? Well, maybe those those tools exist more so than we've we've been um, uh, extracting as of yet. So I, I'll plead some amount of ignorance, but also um, uh, raise it as a as a continued discussion for sort of early time users, especially when we're dealing with point clouds as, as, as in their fundamental form. And, um, understanding where those classifications come from is is something I think we can um, learn more from, learn more about, or I would like to learn more.
that could be a, a one of my own limitations rather than a community limitation. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. A lot about this. Do you think that I noticed you switched to TLS for doing that? Do you think that the degree you get TLS gets up to the relevant seven templates that slide artists can't quite get in the resolution you need? It also brings the plant. Danica's here. Oh. Yeah. I think that's one of the reasons we haven't really been explored yet. We haven't really seen whether we need a centimeter scale or a centimeter or a meter or, or what the cost benefit is, but I think scales. So that's what I think we're really interested in looking at. That's another piece of the design. But I think I wanted to mention that. That's something we wrestle with a lot. And when I was a grad student, I made decisions based on what made pretty maps. And um, since then, we've tried to come up with some more systematic means to do that. But it is, I think it's completely application dependent. But I'm not sure that we still have a set of metrics, analyses, protocols for ideas for how to find that characteristic length scale. I mean, we did come up with one suggestion for what you know, is an appropriate scaling length in the forest based on hits and mounds, things like that. But in, in a channel bed, you know, things like gravel, bed forms, things like that, it just is so problem dependent that um, it, it merits the, the level of, of rigor in terms of asking the question, but I, I think it's something that each researcher needs to sort of confront. But again, um, having the tools available for them to ask how to answer the question, I think is something we don't have a very good handle on. Uh, your comment about the uh, overhang has got me confused on this. Um, and it applies also, I think, also to process. Um, one of the ways we've been thinking about how to process is the first step you go about uh, is somebody that has a question of error or a good process to move them along, um, is to do a redirection process or extend the space in the direction. And uh, if you're doing Yeah, I, I, Toby, I don't have a good question. I don't have much to say apart from maybe we just need to change our perspective. No yeah. pun intended, but literally, I think the, um, the stratigraphy of the, the basalt flows is a big part of the story here. So these overhangs occur because of feedback between the properties of the, the rocks and weathering and hydraulics and things like that. So it'd be great to be able to measure those in those environments. Um, but yeah, it just takes effort, right? It's just it's a lot of, of, of time and um, defining them relative to a surface, um, yeah, would require some some thinking. Um, that, but we haven't we haven't confronted it yet. We're just thankful that we have some data to start uh, thinking about. All right, so we're gonna have Vicky Perini, and she's a research scientist at the Lamont Doherty. And for once, maybe I will remember to open this. It's an honor. Uh, maybe. <coughs> remember, I'm not a user of a Mac, but I think I can figure this one out. Right there. Oh, there you are. All right. So I'm going to uh, transition us into the marine environment. Um, and tell you about some work that we've been doing at Lamont to make elevation data accessible to non-specialist users. 
So I think uh, it's pretty clear from what we're all working on that topography is a fundamental earth science data set. And really the, the surface you know, extends deep into the ocean, which um, covers the majority of the planet. I was first putting this list of uses of um, topography data together, thinking only about the ocean, but really it, it transcends both environments. There might be a few um, more specific things for ocean research and exploration, because we know so little about the ocean, um, which affects how we plan our field programs. Also, the ocean is very inaccessible. We can't go there and visit it repeatedly and look at it with our eyes. Uh, and when we do go there, we're looking sort of through a straw at a very limited view. Um, it's very expensive to get there, et cetera. And also when there's things like um, ocean search and rescue efforts, like the MH370 uh, plane crash, we don't really have very good base maps to start from to plan those kinds of um, reconnaissance missions to find wreckage. Um, and we can't deploy robotic vehicles without having those sort of fundamental base maps. So um, I tried to step back a little and think about the different modes of accessing elevation data and thinking about the continuum between non-specialist and specialist users. And sort of at one end of the spectrum, from the non-specialist perspective, you might have a phone app where you're looking at a map. You might want to interrogate that for a Z value. Uh, you might also want to interrogate um, some surface that's been rendered for you and, and maybe make profiles if you don't have the skill set to do that and grid the data yourself. That's sort of the least specialized um, access. Uh, you also might want to interrogate a data set and extract a raster uh, at some custom resolution for some area of interest. You might also want to go and find uh, the source data, whether it be the raw data or the point clouds or individual grids, and do various analyses with those. And then even further along the specialist spectrum, perhaps, is uh, programmatic access, computer to computer, querying services to get values or grids or images through web services. Uh, likewise, there's variable uh, format requirements uh, from the non-specialist to specialist uh, spectrum or continuum, from images uh, to grids and point clouds, and then all the way back to the source data. So trying to make sure that these different formats are available, I think, is a very important task. Uh, and then, of course, there's variable resolution requirements that are driven, presumably, by the science questions that you're trying to answer. So uh, um, what you're seeing there is a roughly one kilometer uh, bathymetric map derived from satellite altimetry data and it's predicted bathymetry. That kind of scale might be perfectly fine for large scale ocean circulation work or uh, global kind of geophysical um, questions. Uh, if we zoom in a little to 100 meter or even down to like five meter resolution, you get a lot more detail. That would be appropriate for different kinds of questions. And you might have to go all the way into submeter resolution. Uh, this map is a hydrothermal vent field in over two kilometers of water depth that I mapped with a remote operated vehicle. Uh, and you can actually see individual vent structures. So it really depends on you know, the questions you're trying to ask or answer. Uh, so then we get to the problem that water conceals the vast majority of our planet. And the majority of what we've got for global ocean maps are predicted. So this is a really simple way of showing sort of the whole uh, scale of the planet, roughly 70% of that being ocean. And then our best estimates are maybe less than 15% of that has actually been mapped with direct measurement. And of those measurements, not all of them are modern methods. Some of them might be lead lines, uh, literally dropping the weight off the side of the ship. Uh, some of those might be contours. Um, so we really don't have a lot of information. And again, as I said, we don't know what it's like to be there. So this is a visualization where I was, uh, this is actually a point cloud rendition of a grid. I, I realize that that's a little bit weird, uh, but it was an experiment um, and we used it in a, a VR cave to see, you know, what would it be like if we're standing on the seafloor? We really have no idea what that's like because we can't do it. So uh, when we think about bathymetry, <laughs> bathymetry data globally, it's very sparse. Uh, we have very little redundancy. Uh, the map on the left, the, the little track line of higher resolution there is an older multi-beam sonar system, with a very narrow swath width and less resolution. Uh, the track on the right side is a more modern one, so we're getting more coverage and better resolution. But all of this information is really important if we're going to splice together a global ocean map. Um, we also have the apples to oranges problem that we can't get away from because the data are so sparse and so rare. We have to really pull all of it together. 
So there's different platforms being used, different sensors being used. Uh, the little shot on the bottom right there is an experiment that I did making a five centimeter resolution grid from a, another vent field. It's really pushing the limitations of the sensor and also the underwater navigation is a huge limitation for us. So um, if we step back to the more ship-based data, um, what is publicly available at the NOAA archives is primarily raw ship-based data. Um, that little network of track lines that you see on the right side might look like there's quite a bit of data density, but of course that's a scaling issue. And when you zoom in, you'll see that the distance between those lines is massive. Um, and of that data that's publicly available, and it's largely publicly available because there's been a lot of um, focus at NSF to make sure that the data that we collect is made available. Um, of that data, it's pretty much all raw, and we need to have specialist knowledge to be able to distill that from the raw sonar format into something that's usable. Uh, the, the bottom left plot there just shows the increase in multi-beam data, or, sorry, expeditions that have acquired multi-beam sonar data over the years from 1980 to present. So we're collecting a lot of data now, it's becoming available, but there's a lot of work to do to integrate it. And how do we do that? Preparation and integration, well there's a lot of, I think, unique challenges that we have in the submarine environment and probably a lot of similarities. I'm not super ver well versed with LIDAR and other optical imaging techniques, but we have things like you know, bad navigation, um, sensor problems, we also can have, so most of these systems are hull mounted and we can have biofouling on those systems which obscures the signal and makes it harder for us to work with the data. We might have dropouts from bad weather. We don't have the option to go back and resurvey sometimes. We're on our way someplace trying to make use of all this data. Um, and so these shots on the right are just some examples of some of the problems that we try to address as we process the data. So this brings me to the global multi-resolution topography synthesis, which we've been curating at Lamont since the early 90s. Uh, it started first focused on mid-ocean ridges and has expanded to the global ocean and also includes terrestrial data. The goal of this project is to make a data compilation that's freely available and helps to deliver the best possible elevation data for a diverse user community, recognizing that we all wanna push the data to the best resolution uh, we're sort of the specialized community here that really wants to go maybe a little bit deeper, but trying to find a sweet spot of what we can do to provide broad access for the community. Uh, so we're combining sparse multi-resolutional data to make um, more complete grids and maps. Uh, we're trying to enable access across disciplines from biologists who might be less well-versed with how to work with sonar data but need it for their work, um, to chemists, to geophysicists. Um, we really want to make sure that we're meeting the needs across that continuum and that we offer different access pathways and formats so that everyone can make use of the data. So a lot of our effort has been focused on processing and integrating this publicly available data from NOAA. Um, one of the objectives there, of course, is to improve science efficiency, mitigating the need for everyone to go and process their own data. So we're going to help make it faster and easier for people to access the data. But we're also providing links back to that um, SWAS data, so the source files in the processed form. The raw ones are at NOAA and can also be accessed for people who need that. Um, we also focus on consuming and integrating publicly available gridded data products. And in that case, we take them sort of as is. We might try to deal with the datum shift, um, but we then just provide links back to the source grids if people need um, access to that. So the way that I like to describe GMRT is that it has basically four discrete components that we maintain independently on the back end and we update them at different schedules. So the topography data, which is relatively static because we're mostly <laughs> marine geophysicists, uh, is a combination of the ASTRA data and the NED data, NED data set. So uh, I don't think we've updated that in uh, quite a few years. Uh, it's a pretty large data set by our global perspective, so uh, we're happy to sort of leave that until we need to update it. Um, we use the JEBCO compilation, which is an international compilation of bathymetric data, which is roughly a kilometer resolution. Um, so that is largely, again, sourced by this predictive bathymetry and then constrained in some places by actual observations. 
We then take contributed grids of variable resolution from less than one meter, like those hydrothermal vent maps I showed you, to hundreds of meters in, in grid size. And then the swath bathymetry that we curate is always gridded at least at 100 meter resolution, sometimes better if the data can support it. And so we basically take these components and we put them together at various resolutions and pre-compose images. But if the user needs to come in and request a grid, they set their, their bounding box and they set their resolution request. And we compose these components on the fly to deliver to them the best possible uh, gridded data set. So this is a, just a little workflow diagram to show how we manage the bathymetry data. Um, we sometimes make use of commercial processing software, but ultimately we push it through open source software called MB System to generate these processed files. We then grid that into a uh, grid based on individual cruises, um, and that is what gets pushed into the GMRT compilation. Those process data files go into basically a file database repository that sits behind a metadata catalog so people can come and search for and download those files directly. So just some numbers on where we're at with this. Um, again, this compilation has been going on since the early 90s. Just from the swath data that we curate, we have an estimated 8.3% of the ocean covered, so a really small amount of the ocean covered. That's from over 200,000 swath data files, 200 million pings, um, over 31 billion points. Um, I won't read you all the numbers, but it, this is from over 1,000 cruises. We try to add about uh, 2 million square kilometers of data a year. Um, and uh, I think, I mean, there's quite a bit of backlog still to get through, um, so we're trying to go as quickly as we can to get the most data in as quickly as possible and get the most bang for our buck. So try to go for the more modern systems with a bigger swap width is better. Um, again, we have this extensive file and cruise level metadata. That